Hello, everyone, uh, and thank you very much for joining us tonight. I'm Danielle Daw. I'm the Adult Services Librarian here at the Halton Hills Public Library, and I will be your host for this evening. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are all joining tonight's call from communities across Ontario, and we recognize that we are all residing in different treaty territories. Um, so I am joining from the Halton Hills Public Library, which is located on the treaty lands and territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit on Treaty 19. So Treaty 19 was agreed upon by the Mississaugas of the Credit and the British Crown in 1818. And we recognize this land as being the home and traditional territory to other Indigenous people since time immemorial. Tonight's lecture is offered in partnership with Credit Valley Conservation and the Town of Halton Hills Climate Change and Asset Management Division. I also want to thank the Friends of the Halton Hills Public Library and CFEW Georgetown for their ongoing support of the Halton Hills Lecture Series. Now there are two housekeeping items before we get started. Um, so the Q&A for tonight's lecture is going to be running through the chat box. Um, so when you submit your question uh, and you're typing it in, we just ask that you direct it to everybody on the call. Um, so that way we can all see the questions coming in. Uh, and one of our library associates, uh, Natalie, is on the call tonight to assist with any technical difficulties you might be having. And then our second note uh, is just to say that tonight's presentation is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel sometime next week. So as you may know, the town of Halton Hills declared a climate emergency in May of 2019 and set a goal to become a net zero community by 2030. To address climate change in our community, the town is taking adaptation and mitigation actions, which include using natural assets such as trees. So during this lecture, you'll learn more about trees and the resources available to residents of Halton Hills. So tonight we are joined by Melanie Kramer, Senior Coordinator of Sustainable Home Landscapes at Credit Valley Conservation. Melanie leads the Your Green Yard program, which promotes the beauty and importance of sustainable landscaping. Her vision is to see all home gardens and landscapes help maintain a healthy, climate resilient environment while flourishing with local, native trees, shrubs, and wildflowers. So Melanie previously worked as a landscape designer until moving to Credit Valley Conservation over 13 years ago. She is a Master of Landscape Architecture and a Master of Environmental Studies. And we are pleased to have her join us tonight to talk about the best native trees for curb appeal, habitat, shade, and fall color. So without further ado, I will hand it off to you, Melanie. Thanks so much, Danielle. Uh, can you hear me okay? Great. So I share my presentation. And can you see the presentation? Yes, wonderful. Okay. So hi, everyone. And uh, thanks so much for joining us for top trees to grow in your yard. Um, and many thanks to uh, both the town of Halton Hills and to the Halton Hills Public Library for inviting me to speak on behalf of Credit Valley Conservation. Uh, I should note that my expertise is in the area of landscape design, as you heard, uh, with a background in landscape architecture. Um, and I brought that together with knowledge from CBC's ecologists and others to determine what will grow well and look attractive in your yards. So my focus is usually on urban and urbanized spaces, um, but Halton Hills obviously has many rural residents as well. So I will mention some of our tree planting programs and other opportunities for larger rural properties as well at the end. I will also leave time for questions as Danielle mentioned. Um, so do feel free to add them to the chat anytime. And, um, and I look forward to answering those toward the end of the, uh, toward the, end of the presentation. So first, a little bit about Credit Valley Conservation, or CVC, as we often refer to it. Like other conservation authorities in Ontario, Credit Valley Conservation is a watershed-based organization. So basically, that means that the area that you see here in green is um, sort of light green from Orangeville down to Lake Ontario. It's kind of like a big bathtub. So um, so all of the water that drains into that area eventually drains out down toward Lake Ontario or has been soaking into the ground, replenishing our groundwater. 
And since 1954, we've been responsible for protecting, restoring, and managing the natural resources within the Credit River watershed. Our vision is a thriving environment that protects, connects, and sustains us. So you may have visited one of our conservation areas, maybe attended an event, another webinar, taken part in a tree planting. Uh, but we also monitor flood hazards, provide permits and regulations, uh, lead research and inv innovation to keep our environment healthy and really climate change resilient, as Danielle was mentioning at the, in the introduction. So through our Your Green Yard program, we connect with landowners uh, using education and on the ground action. And our partner municipalities do make much of this work possible. So funding and support of our programs, workshops, and events is generously provided by both our regional and municipal partners. So I do want to say hello to anyone who may have joined us who lives in the Hungry Hollow SNAP neighborhood. You may have been hearing more from us recently. Uh, SNAP stands for the Sustainable Neighborhood Action Plan. And the Hungry Hollow SNAP has been developed in partnership between CBC and the town of Halton Hills. Uh, as you see here, uh, this, these are the boundaries on the left side of your screen. Um, it is a neighborhood-based project where CVC, along with the town, local residents, and the community develop and implement a neighborhood-based action plan. And that is to create a cre clean, green, climate-resilient community. So as you see in the map, it is part of the Delrex neighborhood on the north side of Hungry Hollow Ravine. So that's a really important area just because it features the ravine. It has both Silver Creek and Black Creek running through it. It's also part of something that CBC calls the Credit River Hungry Hollow Center for Biodiversity. And so that's a really significant natural area with really invaluable biodiversity. It's high quality habitat and it includes some rare endangered species. So the Centers for Biodiversity, we just, um, we have several within our watershed and they're really important to the overall health of the Credit River watershed. So that's one of the reasons that we're focusing on that area. So I will share details later, but residents who live within that neighborhood specifically will be eligible to choose a free native tree or shrub that we deliver and help to plant. But more on that. But tonight's webinar is for all who live in Halton Hills. And the approach that we use to designing your home landscape is called sustainable landscaping. So it's support for both the ecological and hydrological health or the land and water within our watershed. So we work to build resilience to climate change, to enhance biodiversity, as I was mentioning, to support local, local wildlife, but also to help you add beauty and curb appeal to your yard. So sustainable landscaping for us has three parts. Uh, tonight's presentation will mostly focus on trees, which falls most clearly under native plant gardening. But really, yard care is essential to your tree's health. Um, and trees with leaves that intercept rainwater, slow it down, roots that help soak, soak it up. Um, trees also contribute to managing stormwater in beautiful and natural ways, or what we call rainscaping. So really it's important and trees are important in all three of these areas. So there are a lot of benefits. Uh, trees and some larger shrubs uh, create shade. They shade our hot surfaces and our landscapes, essentially often acting like air conditioning for your yard and your neighborhood. Um, really hard hot surfaces like roads, driveways, roofs um, can create that heat island effect that you've likely um, heard about or experienced uh, with hotter temperatures during the day, but also those surfaces re-radiating the heat at night as well and making the um, air much warmer. So one study in Toronto actually found that there was almost a 12 degrees Celsius difference between the average temperature of the tree shaded surfaces versus non shaded surfaces. So the tree shaded surfaces were almost 12 degrees cooler. Increasing shade in our neighborhoods is um, one way that we can help to decrease, decrease this heat island effect and our best tool is planting trees. So native trees and plants in our gardens are essential to the local biodiversity of the birds, pollinators, other insects and more. The more biodiversity, the more, um, the more our landscapes can bounce back from things like drought or resist invasive species. Trees can also act as a windbreak, uh, particularly when planted on the northwest or north side of your house. 
They can create privacy between houses or between your house and the street. And they can add a lot of beauty and color to your yard as well. So there are a lot of benefits. But of course, we do want to plant the right tree in the right place uh, in order for it to thrive and to bring all of those benefits to your yard and community. If you look at the conditions in your neighborhood and your yard, they will differ in different places even throughout your own yard. Then once you've chosen your location, you want to choose a tree that fits the location and that matches your needs. So in your neighborhood, there may be large mature trees. I know there are in a lot of areas in Halton Hills, really lucky that way. Um, and a lot of these could be enhanced by planting a woodland garden below, planting some smaller trees, planting some shrubs. Um, soon you may notice some woodland wildflowers such as hepatica or bloodroot or spring beauty in your local forest or ravine. Uh, some of these understory species will also do well in your yard. But you can also consider planting shrubs. And this evening I'll be talking about some companion species that would grow well with some of those top trees. Um, but if you don't already have mature trees, then there may be really hot surfaces that could use some more shade like these trees are providing to help cool them down. In your own yard, look for places where you can create new landscaped areas or places where you can just add some color and diversity to your existing gardens by adding some native trees, shrubs, or ground covers. So next, you want to consider how much light the plants will get in each space you want to plant. So choose the right plant for the right amount of sunlight, as well as the right soils, um, but the right amount of sunlight in that particular spot. So just the placement of structures, a garage, a shed, or a fence um, can create a different uh, microclimate, so different conditions. It might be cooler or drier, hotter, um, hotter or moister. So those growing conditions um, will factor into what can grow in that location. And that's even just within your own yard that it can be quite different. Once you have an idea of where you want to plant, you might want to look a bit more closely. Uh, you might want to check your soil. So if you're not familiar already with uh, the difference between sand and loam and clay, um, sand, sandy soils are really gritty. The water drains quite quickly. A lot of people in uh, Halton Hills tend to have sand or loam and sometimes clay loam. Uh, the loam is, uh, tends to be a, a bit fluffier. It's a really nice mix between sand and, loam, or sand and, uh, and clay. Um, and the water sort of drains steadily through that. Clay is the one that really is like concrete when it's dry. Uh, when it's wet, you can um, sometimes roll it into a log or it'll stay in the shape of a ball. You can squeeze it, it will hold its shape and the water drains slowly from it. So you wanna consider what, what kind of soil you have. You also want to think about what you like to do in your yard and match plants to how wet or dry it is where you want to plant. Um, think about things if there are any obstacles, a clothesline, power line, you want to avoid planting uh, trees directly beneath those. To check underground, uh, you want to call Ontario One Call. So that's a free service and they come to mark any underground utilities where they're buried and uh, you simply give them a call and it will be a week to two week window and um, they will show up and put those markings on your property and they will disappear the next one or two times that it rains. So they'll mark things like water pipes, gas lines, so we, you can know where not to dig. For those who are eligible who live in the Halton Hills Snap neighborhood or Hungry Hollow Snap neighborhood, the, uh, the tree shrub giveaway, we actually contact Ontario One Call before we plant and they come to mark the utilities in your yard. So like I said, it is free and the markings will fade after a week to a week and a half. So if you love birds, you can also use trees and shrubs to attract and protect them. So you want to plan for food, uh, berries as well, but um, even more importantly, insects. So, um, so I'll be talking about this evening about the importance of trees for birds, but also for insects and how that, um, that food web is created. 
So, and of course, birds also use trees for roosting and nesting. Different birds use trees and shrubs of different heights. So thinking of layering is really important. You can include a variety of different trees of different heights that benefit birds at different, that, um, that use them at different heights, as well as making your yard cool and lush. So when you're designing your yard, you wanna try to think of the different layers of plants, even if you're only adding just trees or trees and shrubs. The layers are quite pleasing to your eye. You can plant a nice grouping, you can add different colors and texture, and you can support different species of birds. So the tall tree layer that you see here, for example, is, um, is great for supporting common species such as blue jays, for example. Uh, chickadees tend to like the lower tree layer. Uh, catbirds and cardinals will, in fact, sometimes nest in the shrub layer. Uh, the, herb, the herb, ground, and vine layers, that includes things like grasses, wildflowers, vines, fern, ferns, sedges, and more. Uh, these can provide shelter for birds like thrushes, sparrows. Um, they can also provide seeds, which some birds like goldfinches really appreciate. Um, also important to uh, when you're thinking about planting trees is leaving the leaves from some of those taller trees. So when they fall, um, you can leave the leaves. They can support um, things like house wrens that are looking for insects. Uh, tonight, I'll focus mostly on the tall tree and lower tree layers, but I'll also include some information on shrubs as companion species. And these are some of the top native trees and shrubs for, uh, for birds in our area. Uh, fortunately, planting these have multiple benefits, like the beautiful white flowers of native cherry trees, um, black cherry, pin cherry, and the choke cherry shrub are all native to our watershed. And so there are a number of different cherries, a number of different oaks, uh, maples. I won't be focusing quite as much on cedars, but they're excellent for supporting birds as well as providing great, um, great cover, shade, um, willows and viburnums as well. So you'll see these come up again and again throughout the presentation. Designing for pollinators is similar in that pollinators need a variety of different plants to meet their needs. But in fact, trees are extremely important to many pollinator life cycles. So you might be familiar with the importance of milkweed to monarchs. Uh, the monarch caterpillar can only eat milkweed. It is known as their host plant. So uh, we could call it baby food, um, but it tends to be called host plants. And a lot of trees are host plants as well. So I'll be mentioning some of those as I go throughout the presentation also. Other pollinators need nectar and pollen at different times of the growing season. And many trees and woodland plants are the first to bloom. So they do produce some of those resources, the nectar and pollen, uh, at times when they tend to be a bit more scarce, like early spring. Here you see the polyphemus moth and uh, the caterpillars use paper birch as a host, but they will also use other trees such as willow, alder, poplar, oak, and ironwood. Uh, some moths and butterflies don't in fact eat as adults. Uh, it is really just at the caterpillar stage that they need to grow and grow and grow in order to be able to um, successfully transform into their moth or butterfly stage. So really having those trees is quite key for the ones that rely on them. And these are the top locally native trees for pollinators. Uh, you see some of the ones that I've mentioned already, uh, cherry, as well as oak, maple, uh, serviceberry, dogwood, and some of those will come up later as well. Um, we do have a plant list that focuses on pollinator plants, and I'll be mentioning all of our plant lists in a little while. Um, but our pollinator pl plant list does mention a couple of other trees that are excellent for pollinators, um, but generally its focus is a bit more on the wildflowers and grasses, um, but really without the host plants, which can be trees, they can also be shrubs, wildflowers, or grasses. Um, without those host plants, you can't really have caterpillars, which means you don't really have moths or, um, or butterflies. So um, 
let me see if I can actually, I can't post that in the chat right now. So Daniela and I have arranged that um, when she is uh, mailing everyone to thank them for coming, she can include some of our links in uh, at that time. So the top trees for your yard are all trees that are native to our watershed, but they're also chosen because they are reliable, attractive, and many of them have tolerances such as salt or drought. So for those of you who live in the Hungry Hollow Snap neighborhood, uh, the featured trees and shrubs are, many of them are included in our giveaway, and those are identified by an asterisk. I'll also highlight some of the companion trees and shrubs that combine well with our featured trees. I'll start with oaks. Oaks are one of our most highly recommended trees because as well as being hardy and reliable, they bring so many benefits to our yards and our local ecosystems. So in fact, over 500 different species of insects will use oaks um, for food or to make their homes. But many times we don't even have a chance to spot them because these insects are an essential food for local birds. So again, it's part of that food web that I've mentioned. As naturalist Yo Wilson noted, insects are in fact the little things that run the world. So many birds need the protein that these insects provide, um, making oaks and other native trees an essential part of the food web. So the tree you see here is a bur oak, and bur oak grow really well in the Halton Hills area, and we do highly recommend them. However, even more than the bur oak, we recommend red oak. Northern red oak is a hardy, reliable, and attractive tree. It's the tree we recommend most for urban and suburban spaces, both because it is tolerant of a lot of urban conditions, but also because, like all oaks, it supports so much wildlife. It is pretty versatile. It can be grown in a variety of soils, but you do need a spot that is in full sun. If it's in part shade while the tree is young, but it's going to grow taller and into full sun, that's fine. Um, but as they grow older, they do need full sun. Red oak is also drought and salt tolerant and really urban tolerant. Um, tends to deal okay with people walking over its roots, with um, some of the urban pollutants, um, and of course, it will live for a really long time. Um, it can grow relatively quickly and can live for hundreds of years. And at this time of year, as trees are just awakening from dormancy, there's still a lot happening on and below the surface of the soil. So the fallen leaves of oak trees uh, create important habitat and food for different kinds of soil organisms. You know, the little critters who break things down into nutrients that the trees and plants can then use to grow. The leaves of oak trees are particularly beneficial because they do take longer to break down than many other leaves, like those from maple trees, for example. So they create a fairly reliable habit, ha sorry, habitat for those decomposer organisms that live in the soil that help to break things down. So leaving leaves on the ground is also important for overwintering insects. Like you see here, the woolly bear caterpillar. So a lot of people see these, tend to see them a lot in the fall, in fact. Um, you see it on the bottom right, and it becomes the Isabel tiger moth uh, that you see on the top right as an adult. And of course, these overwintering insects are wonderful in and of themselves. They are also part of that food web. Um, the overwintering insects and the decomposers can be important food for other wildlife, including birds. So again, oaks, and in particular here, the northern red oak, are a key part of that. As they mature, red oak trees provide a fairly dense shade, uh, so any plants that you're grouping with them should be somewhat uh, tolerant of shade, unless you're planting them a little bit further away, sort of in front of them, that kind of thing. Red oaks are part of that top canopy that we saw, or the tall tree layer. Um, in the lower tree layer, ironwood can make a really good companion, and I'll be talking about ironwood um, in a few moments. A service berry can also play this role um, in the lower tree layer and provides excellent color and interest. You see the berries here. Um, I'll feature both of these smaller trees in a moment. A great option for the shrub layer is purple flowering raspberry. It also tolerates shade but will do well in part sun or sun, uh, so it's very versatile. Um, it also grows well in drought and compacted soil. So for those in the Hungry Hollow Snap neighborhood, you can see all these species are available in that giveaway. 
next to recommend we have white spruce. It's a fairly dense evergreen with really nice form, grows nice and evenly, can provide shade, windbreak, privacy, and even some winter green in the landscape. Plus they look lovely, lovely draped in snow. So it does grow up to about 15 meters tall, it does well in a variety of soils. The needles in fact can be quite fragrant. Uh, sometimes if there's um, a branch that I want to trim from, from some evergreens, I will um, bring them inside in maybe November and actually just put them in a vase of water and they'll keep for a month or two. And so uh, white spruce gives you these, this lovely um, fragrance when you're close to it. Uh, they do well in drier soils, but dry to slightly moist. So they're quite versatile there as well. They do provide, again, that cover for birds, whether it's in the summer or in the winter. And then of course, uh, they are fairly tolerant of drought and compaction, but you do want to avoid planting them someplace close to where salt is spread in the winter. Uh, because it does have the year round needles, they can create a wonderful um, privacy screen or a windbreak. But as well, birds such as black capped chickadees, cedar waxwings, Finches and several others rely on white spruce for food and shelter. Uh, some birds may choose to shelter a nest in the upper branches, and uh, once it's grown much taller, other species perhaps in the mid and lower branches. And the bird you see here is a bay breasted warbler. So, what to combine it with? Um, some great companion. Plants include paper birch. Uh, the white bark of paper birch stands out really nicely against the green of the spruce, providing again that year round interest. It looks really great. They look really great in winter. Uh, they can often be found growing together in a forest as well. You can use white spruce as that dark green backdrop to accentuate other shrubs and plants as well. So you can add northern bush honeysuckle in part sun to sunny locations near your spruce. It's a fairly low, low growing shrub uh, that can be grown alone or grouped together to form a cluster, or they can be grown uh, along a fence, for example. They will sucker somewhat and expand slowly over time. Uh, purple flowering raspberry would also do well planted nearby. But if you wanna plant some great ground covers in shady areas below white spruce, um, then you can select native plants that do well in dry shade. And the one I featured here is zigzag, zigzag goldenrod. So um, it's a bit shorter than some of the goldenrods that you might think of seeing in um, local ditches or natural areas. Um, and it will grow to form nice patches, but it's, it's fairly easy to control. Um, and Goldenrods are excellent for supporting uh, pollinators, particularly in the fall. So we also find that maples, of course, are really important and uh, tend to be one of the most recognizable trees. So I believe the town will be selling red maples in their Earth Day plant sale. And sugar maples are also in abundance and you'll see them in a lot of your local natural areas. And sugar maples really do make sense if you have a location away from where salt is spread and where people don't tend to walk a lot. They don't like the compaction of walking on their roots all the time and they are sensitive to salt. But if you have the perfect corner of your backyard or if you own a larger property, then sugar maples might be a perfect choice for you but our most resilient maple is Freeman maple. It's a naturally occurring cross between silver and red maples. We feature Freeman maple because it is hardy and it does well in most locations, but it also has great fall color, nice form, and it's easy to grow. So it's another tree that would grow into the um, taller upper canopy, the tall tree layer. It will grow well in a variety of soils and uh, it is fairly versatile from dry to moist as well. Uh, it does have a lot of tolerances, compaction, um, drought as well. It is slightly salt tolerant, but, uh, but I wouldn't plant it where, um, where it would get a ton of salt, um, but it will resist it better than, better than sugar maple. It's not as sensitive. So um, you may have noticed in the previous slide, I may just go back to that. You see here a bud that's actually just before it blooms. And in the spring, Freeman maple have really lovely um, small red flowers. 
that just look wonderful when they're covering the tree and they um, they bloom before the leaves are out. And it's really noticeable. It's quite a fun thing to watch in the spring. I actually have a Freeman maple in my yard and love watching that every spring. Um, and then sort of repeating that color because those blooms are red, but they have um, they have a little bit of yellow in them as well. And cream and maple can be anything from red to orange to sort of a peachy yellow color in the fall. So um, they're often prized for their leaf color and homeowners really appreciate that. Freeman maple also supports hundreds of butterfly and moth species uh, like this rosy maple moth. So uh, the caterpillars um, I do not always have a chance to look quite so lovely because some of them become food for many species of birds, including grosbeaks, sparrows, and finches. Uh, maple trees also provide nesting sites for birds and the seeds are eaten by finches and squirrels. So you can see again, they're an essential part of that, uh, of that local food web. Freeman maple can be grown alone, but you can also group it with uh, red oak or white spruce and many of our other native trees. Some shrubs that are a good match with Freeman maple include the purple flowering raspberry and nine bark, uh, both medium sized flowering shrubs that are tolerant of most urban conditions. Purple flowering raspberry is somewhat sensitive to salt, but eastern nine bark will tolerate that as well. Our next featured tree is Eastern Hop Hornbeam, uh, better known as Ironwood. Uh, it's a tree species that is just beginning to attract interest um, and be planted as an urban tree. Due to its ability to grow in different soil types, it's drought tolerance, um, and it's a really strong, the wood is really strong, so it's quite resistant to wind and snow load damage. So it is a fairly slow growing tree. It's, um, it's a bit smaller than the trees that we've seen previously and would be in that second layer. It's best suited to uh, shade or partly shaded areas, but it can grow in full sun. So here you see it grows anywhere from three to 15 meters tall. But like I said, it does grow slowly. So it stays um, as a fairly small tree in your yard. It grows well in a variety of soils, sand, loam, or clay and um, is drought tolerant. It has a really nice yellow fall color and uh, its name for eastern hop hornbeam comes because the fruit clusters actually resemble hops. And some of those fruit clusters do persist over winter, uh, providing a bit of extra food for birds. Um, some of the leaves still cling as well, so it's um, it's got quite a bit for winter interest as well as the um, a slightly shaggy bark, which you can see here in the middle. So really quite attractive all year round. Uh, sometimes it can be caught confused with blue beech, which is also known as American hornbeam. Uh, so, but our ironwood that we're talking about today, the Eastern hop hornbeam, has, uh, has that shaggy bark that really helps to distinguish it. Northern red cardinals will eat the seeds of ironwood in winter, as do some other birds, downy woodpeckers, purple finches, vireos, and kinglets. Uh, nuthatches and brown creepers will eat the insects hiding in that shaggy bark, and, um, and ironwood makes a great uh, lower tree layer in your garden. Iron, ironwood itself makes a great companion for some of the taller, faster growing trees like maples and oaks, uh, just as we might observe in a forest, of course. And then we do have some shrubs that I've noted here that can make good companions for ironwood. So choke cherry, for example, an understory shrub. And this would be when we were looking at um, some of the species that are really excellent for birds and for pollinators. The cherries, this is one of our three native cherries. So ch choke cherry is more of an understory species, a small tree, large shrub that um, really prefers dry to moist locations and has a number of tolerances as well. It does have white flower clusters in June, which are really attractive, and then purple berries in summer. So um, it can actually attract, the purple berries can be eaten by thrushes, orioles, and tanagers. 
Freeman's maple, which we've already seen, um, can grow quite well with it. Um, if you have a larger Freeman maple, for example, uh, you could plant ironwood beneath because of its shade tolerance. American witch hazel is an excellent small tree or large shrub if you have uh, sander loam in particular. It's uh, very shade loving and uh, so it grows well below a more mature or maturing ironwood. Uh, it is the last shrub to flower. So it's actually really interesting to go through a forest when you see a number of witch hazels in something like late October, early November, and you actually can still see the fragrant yellow flowers that you see here and you can see them clinging. Um, they're the last flower that you'll see. So another feature tree is another small tree. It's uh, very versatile as well. It features beautiful flat topped uh, creamy spring flowers and can be found growing in natural areas nearby in Halton Hills. And so that's the alternate leaf dogwood. It's also called pagoda dogwood for the way um, that it has these horizontal or sort of tiered branches and you can kind of, um, you can see through. So um, you can sometimes peek through, see um, other structures behind like your house or your deck. It's not quite as solid a shade as, um, as some of the larger trees. So it does give a really nice dappled shade, however, and because it grows in sun or sh shade, it's great for combining with some of those larger, more mature trees. It, uh, it can also stand alone, but I really like grouping it um, either below some of those larger mature trees or just in a grouping with other smaller trees and shrubs. The fruits are not particularly tasty for us, for humans, but they do provide food for various songbirds, such as robins, cedar waxwings, downy woodpeckers, and some others. Um, even grouse, pheasants, wild turkey, if you have a larger property. Um, alternate leaf dogwoods, uh, all dogwoods actually, is um, it's a host for several moth and butterfly caterpillars. And the one that you see here is the Cecropia moth. And uh, it also will support the spring or summer azure butterflies. So companions for alternate, our alternate leaf dogwood include smooth surface berry, and I will talk about that next. If you're looking for shorter shrubs, you could try something in moister areas like white meadow sweet, which is quite a low shrub. Um, it can be grown in moist areas in full sun and has these really nice white flowers in June through early August. Spice bush is also fairly small, a little bit larger than meadowsweet. Uh, it prefers moist areas as well in partial or full shade. And so it doesn't necessarily do well in clay soil, but, um, but it will do well in loam or sand and it is drought, salt and compaction tolerant. So it has white flowers in April, but then fragrant leaves in the summer. So actually the leaves, um, part of why it's called spice bush is when you crush, crush those leaves, uh, they have a really pleasant spicy aroma. Uh, the green berries turn red in the summer and uh, those berries attract robins, catbirds, and wood thrushes. In drier areas, you could look to plant alternate leaf dogwood with uh, shrubs such as purple flower and raspberry. If you're looking for another small tree, we've been talking about grouping them together, for example, uh, service berries are one of my favorite shrubs. And this one can be grown as a large shrub, multi-stemmed, or a small tree, depending how it's pruned. You see some examples here. Uh, service berries are sometimes referred to as Saskatoon berry. Uh, with the one that uh, we often feature is smooth service berry. It grows up to about six meters tall. And it pairs really well with red oak, freeman maple, or alternate leaf dogwood. Uh, you can also cluster just a few together um, or grow one on its own, although I always like to see them in a grouping. Uh, here's an example of a service berry grown as a single stemmed small tree. So it does have some salt tolerance, but shouldn't be planted in locations that have salt spread heavily in the winter. One of the reasons that I love it is because the spring blooms arrive a day or two before the leaves fully emerge and then they're followed by the berries and those berries attract birds 
Um, but those berries are also really delicious for humans as well. So you may have to fight them for it. Uh, but then it also has really great red to orange fall color. It's quite vibrant. So it's really great through all seasons. Um, I quite appreciate uh, it at all times of the year. Um, berries that, birds that are attracted to the berries include the American robin, uh, as you see here, as well as uh, orioles, thrushes, woodpeckers, and waxwings. So it's a, it also has those early spring flowers and they're excellent for pollinators and is a source of nectar and a host plant for butterflies. And uh, it's a host plant for the red spotted purple and viceroy butterflies. Some additional companions for a smooth service berry include uh, choke cherry, once again, uh, common snowberry, which is a smaller shrub, um, prefers dry to moist areas and full sun or part shade. Uh, it's pretty urban tolerant, drought and compaction tolerant, and has pinkish flowers in June or July. And the white berries often remain in the winter, which give it, give it its common name of common snowberry. Uh, if you were to be purchasing common snowberry, I just want to note you want to avoid purchasing the western snowberry, which is quite invasive. Uh, but the common snowberry can also be thicket forming, uh, and that can be excellent shelter for birds. Uh, the Freeman's maple as well, um, we've already noted, grows well with smooth service berry uh, because it will grow well in shade of any taller mature trees. And there are a few other top trees that I want to mention. So black cherry was introduced earlier as one of the trees that hosts a lot of pollinators in their larval life, stage of life. So it is wonderful all on its own with really beautiful spring blooms and edible cherries for you or the bird. Um, but as with all cherries, it is subject to the black knot fungus. So you do need to be vigilant about removing any affected branches as soon as you notice any of that fungus. However, it's definitely one, and it is a taller tree, so it would be part of that taller canopy. Um, but it is excellent and you will see it um, sometimes on private properties as well as uh, down in the ravines. Uh, white, pan, white pine you will see growing in sandier soils. I really love it as a coniferous or evergreen tree because of its um, softer sort of pliable needles. They blow a bit more in the wind. It's a little bit more whimsical looking than uh, the white spruce that we saw earlier. Uh, you do really need to avoid salt and salt spray though. It's actually quite sensitive to that. So if you have um, the perfect location for an Eastern white pine, I definitely encourage you to grow it. Shagbark hickory is another um, highly recommended tree that grows in full to part sun. And you will see a lot in a lot of the upland natural areas in Halton Hills. It has fantastic yellow fall color. And uh, you see the unique peeling bark here that gives it its name, the uh, shagbark hickory. So it looks really nice. It's quite a great feature in the winter. Um, however, it's not salt tolerant um, and it does have a long tap root, which can make it tricky to transplant. Um, but it is a wonderful addition that can complement our local woodlands. And then some of, out of some of the shrubs that I've mentioned, these are just the shrubs that we offer in our um, giveaway, which is offered in the Hungry Hollow Snap. Um, these shrubs grow well with many of the previous trees that we've discussed tonight. Um, but they can also be planted in other areas of your yard, either front or backyards. Um, shrubs can make a good choice for some areas that can't accommodate larger trees. Um, if you have power lines growing overhead, for example, or that narrow space between driveways. Uh, so I think I've mentioned a lot of the um, a lot of the conditions in which they grow. But purple flowering raspberry, I do want to highlight um, the really lovely pink blooms, and they do get a fruit just like our common raspberry, uh, and it's a little bit drier, so um, a lot of people prefer to leave it for the birds. But it is edible, it's, um, but people really tend to grow it for the blooms, hence its name, purple flowering. So it, like I said before, it does, um, it can spread and form a bit of a thicket. And uh, 
but a lot of people plant it, they might plant a group of three or five, maybe along a fence or below um, a window in front of your house and just allow them to grow and thrive there. White meadow sweet really prefers moist areas and full sun um, and does have these really nice white flowers. It's quite easy to sort of keep control of. It doesn't grow too quickly. Um, Northern bush honeysuckle, it will spread over time. It's suited to dry or moist areas in uh, full sun or part shade. So I do have some slides toward the end, uh, just about ways that you can stay involved, you can learn more with Credit Valley Conservation. But I think right here, we'll take a quick break for questions. Yeah, so if anyone has a question, um, feel free to pop it in the chat now and we'll ask it to Melanie. Um, I do have some to get us started. Um, some questions were coming in about uh, the specific trees you were mentioning that had berries. Um, so the purple flowering raspberry and the choke cherry, um, do they produce berries that people can eat or is it just certain species? Uh, no, they, so the purple flowering raspberry, I was just mentioning toward the end um, that they do produce berries that people can eat. Um, I quite like them, but um, they just are a little bit drier than our co common raspberry. So um, yeah, people don't usually grow them for the berries themselves. They grow them for the, um, for the attractive flowers. But, uh, you know, if you're thinking of growing them and you have kids running around or grandkids running around, um, it's totally safe to be growing those. And the uh, choke cherry, generally people don't want to eat them. You can make choke cherry jam. I know that my grandmother used to make a um, choke cherry wine as well. So um, things can be made from them, but they usually need to be cooked. Um, otherwise they do leave your throat feeling sort of dry. Um, they're not poisonous either though. And I see a question just popped in saying, what are your thoughts about black walnut trees? Oh, black walnut trees are pretty amazing. They are, um, they're an integral part of our natural areas. And uh, we don't usually recommend them as a top tree because we're often talking to people who have small yards and, uh, and people often don't want the black walnuts um, sort of as they, they fall and then they start to decompose and, um, and that substance can really be um, tracked. Uh, but also, and turns your fingers black and, you know, some people don't appreciate them for that, but even more so, um, they actually send out a substance. So as they break down both their roots, um, and when the leaves fall, as the leaves start to break down, um, there's a substance, juglones, that's, uh, that's released into the soil. And so it can make it quite difficult to grow other things. Uh, there are certain plants that will grow quite well with them. And so in, um, I mentioned earlier that we do have some plant lists. And so I can just show one of them here, our woodland uh, woodland, woodland plants. And, uh, and so we do note plants that are juglone tolerant. So uh, you can grow quite a nice grouping, but you would be limited and you would be limited in terms of uh, if you had a vegetable garden, something like tomatoes won't grow well um, near black walnuts. And there was a related question, yeah, that was coming in about what would you recommend to grow with walnut or emerald cedar trees? Um, I'd have to go through and think about that a little bit further. <laughs> I'm not usually planting black walnut plantings. Um, I'm trying to think, I'm thinking a couple that might be tolerant i think some of our service berries are so yeah service berries would grow quite well with um with black walnut um what was the other one that you said the emerald uh, emerald cedar trees yeah so i'm assuming that's a little bit taller um it depends what you're looking for i mean even there um something like a paper birch growing nearby uh, can really stand out if you have a cedar hedge or um, or just a larger, if you have larger cedars. Um, if it's something smaller, you might be looking for something more shrub-like. I guess it depends if it's dry or moist. Um, maybe something like, um, like nine bark. Uh, 
Yeah, there'd probably be a few dogwoods that would grow nicely with the emerald cedar and sort of provide a nice contrast visually with it. Um, but you might want to grow something smaller um, in front of it as well. It depends if it's sun or shade. Uh, one shrub that's actually quite popular, one native shrub, is smooth rose. And so if you were planting um, on the sunnier, so like on the south side and it's got full sun, you might want to plant um, a grouping of three smooth rows and, uh, and then you have those really nice pink flowers and you'd have the emerald cedars in behind. So something that could work well. And then someone else was asking with regard to walnut trees, are there any um, bugs or birds in particular that are attracted to the walnut trees? That I can't answer off the top of my head. So um, yeah, I mean, they tend to be larger trees. So I know lots of birds will still use them. I think um, uh, blue jays would definitely visit. Um, and I think a lot of our other songbirds, you know, cardinals and so on would at least visit. But as far as special relationships, I'm not, I'm not familiar and I'd have to uh, have to look that up or talk to our ecologists. All right, and then uh, there are a couple of questions that came in about uh, the SNAP area. Um, so someone trying to uh, figure out if they're in the SNAP area, and then someone asking if their neighborhood can be included in the SNAP program. Um, so maybe you can just speak a bit more to uh, how SNAP is defined. Sure, um, I did have a map up at the beginning, um, but if you're wondering if you're within the SNAP area and you're interested in the giveaway, uh, there actually is a link there where you can enter your address and find out if you're in the area or not. Um, the boundaries have already been determined. That was um, part of an ongoing um, uh, project with uh, CVC, the town of Halton Hills, um, and, uh, and some community partners as well that are um, contributing to make um, that neighborhood uh, really to increase biodiversity, make it even more climate resilient. Um, so the boundaries for the project are set, but you can look up uh, your address um, and that will be included in your, um, in your email that you're sending out after Danielle. I see, it looks like Jennifer Spence has raised her hand. So let me just see. She's with the town of Halton Hills. Just pop over here. She may have something to add. Thanks for letting me uh, let me speak for a minute, Danielle. So the SNAP area was um, developed around the north side of of the Hungry Hollow area. It was developed, we developed it in probably uh, 2019 and um, we're working on the implementation stage of it now. Um, so basically it's, it's, um, it's working with people in that Delrex area um, so that they lessen their impact their environmental impact on their own property because what happens is as the water gets um, water runs off of people's property it ends up down in the Hungry Hollow uh, ravine and that ravine area has been declared as a biodiversity hotspot. It, there's a lot of special plants and special trees that are in that area that we're trying to protect. So um, it's also targeting the Delrex area because the, the area is an older area of Halton Hills. And at the time, what they would do is they would connect the downspouts and then um, the downspouts would be connected to the storm sewers and it would fast track the water into that Hungry Hollow area. So we're starting to work with people in that community so that they'll disconnect their downspout so that they'll help slow down the water so that they'll plant um, native trees and shrubs in the area to help the water um, sink into the ground there instead of rushing down into the Hungry Hollow area. So I hope that answers your question. The, the SNAP document is on the Town of Halton Hills website. You can Google it and it's also on the Credit Valley Conservation um, website as well. And you can take any of the ideas that are in there and implement them in your own area. And um, that's what we're hoping people in Halton Hills will do.
Thank you. Great, thanks, Jennifer. And uh, as Melanie mentioned towards the beginning of the presentation, um, when we do the, the follow-up uh, email after um, probably on Wednesday or Thursday, we'll include a lot of these resources um, in a handout for you guys um, so that you do have access to all the links that are being discussed. Danielle, I do have um, a couple of other events that are taking place in um, in the Hungry Hollow Snap as well. So did you want me to run through those other slides now? Yeah, if you want to run through the slides, we can uh, okay. rather see. And if we have any other questions, we could just um, go through them at the end. I don't have another map of Snap, but I do have a couple of events. So first of all, I'll mention a couple of webinars that we have coming up. We have uh, landscaping for pollinators. We have two, there's pollinators in your yard and top plants for butterflies, bees, and more. And uh, then we have top invasive plants in your yard. So one thing I didn't focus on today um, is really um, some of the benefits of, natives, of native plants um, in contrast to invasive plants which can move in and take over uh, some of our natural areas and um, and decrease biodiversity as well. So um, really having a healthy yard can support all of our natural areas. And uh, you can learn about that more at some of our upcoming webinars. They are designed for Halton Hill SNAP residents, um, but all are welcome to attend. So we do have a monthly gardening e-newsletter, The Garden Post. It features one native plant each month, plus garden care tips, other sustainable landscaping topics in each issue. So you can just um, subscribe at the address above as well. Uh, for the more rural folks, we have uh, the Countryside Stewardship Mail, if you're not already familiar with it. And that is an e-newsletter featuring sustainable actions on rural properties. Uh, we also have grants for our more rural landowners, uh, those with uh, more than one acre of property. So you can take a look at our website posted there or email stewardship at cbc.ca for more information. So in addition to the Your Green Yard program, CBC has lots of other ways to get involved. Um, we do have public plantings and events, and you can see a couple here. So there's one at West Branch Park, uh, and that's a tree planting with, and that's in conjunction with Trees for Halton Hills. And then on Saturday, May 14th in Joseph Gibbons Park, there's a tree planting for older adults. So you can find that information on our events page that you see there, cbc.ca slash events. If you are part of a business or institution, we have our Greening Corporate Grounds program and uh, staff there can help you develop an action plan that's right for your property, your vision uh, and your budget. So uh, you can help future-proof your business by investing both in nature and in your property. So whether you're looking to plant trees on your property, develop a pollution management plan or create an outdoor lunchroom, or even manage stormwater, you can use sustainable landscaping at work as well as at home. So you can uh, find out more and contact us through the website that you see there. And then uh, if you're looking for further trees, the town of Halton Hills, they will have their online tree sale um, April 22nd. So you can see the, um, the address there, haltonhills.ca slash earthweek. And uh, they have a lot of the species that I've talked about tonight. Um, I'm trying to think, they have white cedar, which wasn't mentioned, but all the rest I think were mentioned. Yep, alternate leaf dogwood, common choke cherry, white cedar, white pine, um, service berry, and a number of others. So um, definitely visit their website and uh, see if that's something that you're interested in. The trees are just $5 per tree. And I did see that there's a maximum of five trees per household. So they're all native trees. And uh, if you're wondering about size, they do come in small individual pots. They're about two to five feet in height. 
we also have a number of resources. We have the plant lists that I held up earlier, and we have some other more how-to guides. So visit cvc.ca slash naturescaping to find out more. And going a bit beyond trees, uh, we do have our seasonal butterfly blitz, which is beginning in May, uh, but you can sign up now. So just visit our website to learn more about training sessions. They're both online and in person this year. Um, you can get involved just by observing the butterflies around you, even in your own backyard. So it's really simple, um, but they will teach you how to find and identify butterflies, uh, how to use the iNaturalist app and more. So we hope you'll visit and join us for, uh, for all the fun. And if you do live in the Hungry Hollow Snap neighborhood, then we at CBC hope you'll take advantage of the giveaway uh, with the species that I ran through earlier, the red oak, Freeman maple, white spruce, alternate leaf dogwood, uh, as well as ironwood, service berry, and then the smaller shrubs, purple flowering raspberry, white meadow sweet, and northern bush honeysuckle. So I just wanted to say a quick thank you then. Um, thanks to everyone for joining us this evening. And many thanks again to the Halton Hills Public Library for including us in their spring lecture series. And thanks in particular to the Town of Halton Hills, the Climate Change and Asset Management Division, division for uh, supporting this webinar. Uh, I really hope that everyone has found the information um, inspirational and uh, that it's information that you can use to improve your property. Um, because we do want to uh, work together to make your community healthier, cooler, um, but then also do things for, for you and your property, enhance beauty and biodiversity, um, all while we're working to build climate change resilience. So um, I will leave it there. And then if there are any additional questions, I'm happy to stick around for a few minutes and answer them. So thanks very much. Yes, so thank you very much, uh, Melanie, for joining us tonight. Um, I want to thank you on behalf of everyone here. Um, it was great that we were still able to get together, um, even though it was virtual. Um, so if you enjoyed tonight's presentation, I invite you to sign up for our second lecture with Credit Valley Conservation on April 26th at 7.30 p.m. Uh, so Brianna McLaughlin joins us to discuss invasive insects and tree health, ongoing issues and emerging threats. Um, so sign up, it's on the library's website. Um, you'll be able to find the link in our events calendar. Um, and that should also be a great presentation looking at the invasive insects. Um, so yeah, um, at this time, once again, thank you to everyone who joined us. Um, and I want to thank our partners for this evening, Credit Valley Conservation and the town of Halton Hills. Once we, again, yes, hope you found uh, it very informative and I see lots of thank yous coming in. So uh, thank you very much, Melanie. And as I mentioned, we'll be sending out all the resources to everyone in a day or so, two um, so that you can get all the links um, and access the resources that were mentioned. All right, so thank you very much, everyone. And we hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>